All right, let's take our Bibles tonight, and I want you to go with me to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter number one, and uh, we're going to look at a couple verses of Scripture here uh, that I hope will be a help to you in dealing with the doctrine of God, dealing with the doctrine of God. So turn to Genesis chapter number one, and uh, when you get there, let's go ahead and stand for the reading of the Word of God. And uh, Drew, oh, never mind, I have some water here, actually. All right. No, I'm good. Thank you. That's all I need. Genesis chapter number one, and we're going to begin reading in verse number one. How many, uh, you know what? We forgot to do our Bible reading, didn't we? And uh, we'll do that after the service. And so, Brother Joe, your job to remind me to do the Bible reading before we leave. Psalm 121. Um, how many of y'all can say Genesis 1-1 by heart? Pretty easy, huh? All right, so let's look at Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. And, uh, and then we'll drop down to verse number 26. Notice what the Bible says. The Word of God says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now drop down to verse number 26. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the seas, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And so um, let's go ahead and pray and then we'll get into the message tonight. And uh, I hope it'll be a help to you as we learn more about who God is. And uh, aren't, don't you love the Lord? Amen. Thankful for God. All right, let's pray. Father, now I ask that you'd help us in these next few moments. And uh, Lord, I know that I need your help uh, to say and to speak, Father, what you put upon my heart. But Lord, I, I just ask that you give us all ears to hear. And I know, Father, the middle of the week, uh, Lord, many of us are, are uh, thinking about uh, uh, work and thinking about family and, Lord, plans and things going on in our lives. But Lord, help us, I pray, to quiet our hearts and minds and focus and zero in on your word. And Lord, use it today to help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. All right, so we have seen over the last couple of weeks some great truths in the word of God about who God is. And tonight I want to focus a little bit uh, on, on, on the fact that God is a triune being. Now, let me just say, first of all, that all of us here tonight are aware of the fact that God is a spirit. Isn't that right? In John chapter 4, verse number 24, most of you can quote that verse. The word of God says that God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter number 24, verse number 39, and I'll read the verse for you. The word of God says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me and see... For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. So God's word tells us that God is a spirit. And then the word of God teaches in other places that you can't see a spirit. A spirit doesn't have flesh and doesn't have bones. Uh, go to Deuteronomy chapter number four. And we'll look at this verse. And we're actually going to go to a lot of scripture. And so I would encourage you to you know, get your fingers loose and ready and turn with me to these places I want you to see it for yourself. Uh, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, make a little note there. Uh, if you're taking notes, then maybe write these verses down so you can go home and study on them tonight. But look in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and look at verse number 15. The Bible says this, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And uh, he goes on to say, uh, look at verse number 21. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swear that I should not... Uh, uh, that I should not go over Jordan and that I should not go in unto that good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. And then it says, um, verse number 23, take heed unto yourself, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you 
and make you a graven image or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. And so the Bible is clear that no man has seen God at any time. And one of the reasons why God's anger was directed towards the people of Israel is because they tried to make a figure to represent a God that they have never seen. And so they tried to fashion God with their hands. And God made it clear that you've never seen my similitude, that you've never seen me before. And so the Word of God teaches that God has never been seen. Now listen to these verses, and we're getting somewhere. Just, just hold on for a few moments. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 15, who is the image of the invisible God. Uh, 1 Timothy 1 verse 17, the Word of God states, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. John 1 18, the Word of God states, No man hath seen God at any time. So all throughout the Bible, and you can find this truth stated from beginning to end, the Bible states that nobody has ever seen God because God is a spirit. Now some of you might be wondering, well, Pastor, what about when the Bible talks about He stretched out His arm? Or what about when the Bible talks about the face of God? Or what about when the Bible talks about the eyes of the Lord? And it talks about all these human qualities that He has. What about all those verses? And the verses are too numerous, but there, there are many verses that I hear, have here in my notes that I could share with you after the service. But all throughout the Word of God, God speaks of Himself as a, as a being with arms and legs and feet and hands and nose and ears and eyes and things of that nature. Well, when we read about that, there's an expression that Bible students use to describe those kinds of qualities, and that is called anthropomorphic expression. And what that simply means is that God uses human language to relate to mankind because God is an incomprehensible God. And so how else are we to know that God hears our prayers unless God relates to us by human, using the language of human uh, uh, knowledge? And so, so we know that the Bible states that God is invisible, but I want to direct your attention to verse number 26, and I ask you this question tonight. If God is invisible, and He is, no doubt about that, if God is invisible, then what does it mean here when the Bible says that God created us in His image? Okay? Now think about that for just a moment. Let the wheels turn. Let it kind of sink in. What does it mean when God says we're created in His image and yet you can see us, but we can't see God? So what does that mean? Well, before I answer that question tonight, and uh, you, you kind of think about that and uh, kind of develop a thought about that for just a moment. But before I answer that question, let me just state some things to be true about God in His Word, all right? Now, we understand uh, the truth of a trinity. How, how many know what, what trinity means when you hear the word trinity, all right? Now, now um, let me just say this. Nowhere in the Bible do we find the word trinity, okay? It's not there. Just like the word rapture is not... Uh, in the Bible, just like the word Bible is not in the Bible, right? So nowhere in the Bible is the word Trinity found. We do find words such uh, like Godhead, and Godhead would be a more scriptural term, but there's nothing wrong with using the word Trinity. In fact, there are some people today uh, that have a problem with using the word Trinity because they say it's a Roman Catholic term. It's a term that the Roman Catholics coined. That's actually not true. Uh, it was coined much, 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 much earlier before the Catholic Church was even formed. But e either way, uh, however, whatever term you want to use, um, the Bible is clear that God is a triune being, that God is a triune person, that God is a triunity. Now, um, the, the reason why there is so much confusion. Now, how many of you have ever had a debate with a Jehovah Witness? Anybody ever had a Jehovah Witness come to your door? How, how many have ever had a debate with a Mormon? Uh, how many have ever had a debate with a Jewish person you know, who, who holds to the religion of Judaism? Uh, or a Muslim, and uh, we've witnessed to a number of Muslims over the last couple of years uh, just knocking doors in this area. In fact, um, I think Scott was with me one Saturday that uh, the, the guy who is the chief priest up here at this, this, this Sikh temple uh, knocked on his door and had the opportunity to talk to him. And he told me that he was open up to all religions. And the moment I said something about Jesus Christ, he shut the door and uh, walked away. Didn't want anything to do with it. 
But the reason why there's so much confusion, and if you've talked to any of those uh, people, then you know that there are many belief systems that deny the truth of the Trinity or deny the truth of the Godhead or the triune God. And the reason why there's so much confusion amongst people, uh, number one, we know that Satan is at work in distorting uh, uh, a, a true teaching and true doctrine, but the truth of the matter is, is that it's not an easy concept to understand. Now, let me just say this. It is an easy concept to believe, but it's not an easy concept to understand. I mean, when we're dealing with God, we're dealing with an incomprehensible God, and we are a finite being. But the truth of the matter is, is that, is that if, if something is stated in the Word of God, we ought not to have a problem believing it, whether we understand it or not. And I, if we had time, I could tell you about a number of things down through the years that I didn't really understand uh, some aspect that the Word of God was teaching. And then over time, as you begin to grow, your understanding be begins to deeper. But that doesn't mean that I never believed something wasn't true from the Word of God, even though I don't understand it. And so there are a lot of people uh, that uh, have different views uh, about the Godhead or about the Trinity and the Word of God. And, and here's, here's what the Trinity states, all right? Here's what the belief of the Godhead is, is that there is one God, but He is a triune being, okay? There is one God, but there are three persons within the Godhead that are co-equal, co-existent, and co-eternal. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, there, there is room for some differences on this issue. Very little wiggle room. I, I mean, if there's an issue on semantics or how someone states it, as long as people, and I don't, you know, I don't care how people try to phrase it or state it, as long as people believe that there is one God who is made up of three people, three persons who are co-equal, co-existent, and co-eternal. That is a fundamental core to Christianity. That is a fundamental core in the Word of God. And so the Bible teaches that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three persons who are distinct and distinguishable one from another. Now, um, you know, uh, I, um, I, I, I work with some guys that go to a Pentecostal church, and I'm sure that you've had uh, run-ins with Pentecostals and going out soul winning, running to people who go to Assembly of Gods and Pentecostal church. And the Pentecostals have a, a, a view and they have a belief that is becoming very, very, very popular in our day and time, but it's, it's called the oneness doctrine. Has anybody ever heard of the oneness doctrine? Uh, some people call it modalism. Modalism has existed for hundreds of years. Uh, I shouldn't say hundreds of years, since the early part uh, of, the, uh, of the 1900s, but it's, you know, the, the, it, it actually even goes back farther than that. But basically, what they believe is that there is only one God but sometimes God manifests himself in different forms. So there's one God, and sometimes he's manifested in the form of God the Father. Sometimes he manifests himself in God the Son. And sometimes he manifests himself uh, in the Holy Spirit. And so even though there's one God, he's never, he's never all three at the same time. Now, now that, that is very easy to disprove, and I'm not setting out to disprove that because I think most everybody in this room uh, does not believe that. But here's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Is Jesus Christ God? Answer the question. Is Jesus Christ God? Absolutely. Now, now think with me now. Is Jesus Christ distinct from the Father? Yes, absolutely. Jesus Christ is not the Father, but Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is not the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is God, and Jesus is God, and the Father is God. And so, so the reason why people get in trouble when studying the Word of God is that people don't put these distinctions. Now, I'm going to show you that the Bible teaches that God is one God, but He exists in three persons, all right? And so this is, this is elementary Bible truth, all right? This is nothing fancy. This is not deep. This is not, you know, this is not going to wow you. Uh, but here's, here's a problem that I think most people make. When people begin to talk about the Trinity and talk about the Godhead, most people run right to the New Testament. And I would agree that the Trinity is not explicit in the Old Testament. It is explicit in the New Testament. 
But the foundation for the Trinity is found here in the book of Genesis. And so we're going to look at some of the Old Testament teachings uh, and then get over into the New Testament. But the first thing I want you to notice is that there, the Bible teaches without, without any um, bones about it that there is one God, but that one God is plural in a sense. All right? Now, let me, let me uh, give you some verses and then I'll, I'll clarify what I mean by that. Now, look at, look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. All right? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, now everybody hear me out before they think I'm, I'm losing my mind. Okay? Now, I believe this. I believe God has preserved the King James Bible in English. How, how many of y'all believe that? Amen? Now, you all have been here with me all these years, these last four years. You all know me well enough. I don't believe that anybody needs Greek or Hebrew to understand the Word of God. We have the King James Bible. All we need to do is define the English words that God has given to us to have understanding. We've got the Holy Spirit, and that's all we need. However, I will say this that the, the Hebrew word for God is Elohim. How many of y'all knew that? Did you all know that? Elohim. Now, now, do you remember when Jesus was on the cross and he was saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? Uh, and then over in Luke's account, I think he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani? And so we know that God's name Elohim, Elohim is a Hebrew word that is plural. Did you all know that? It's a Hebrew word that is plural. The I am on the end of Eloi makes it plural. It's kind of like putting the S on, on the end of a word, you know? So if I was to say the pew, uh, when I put an S on pew, it becomes pews and it makes it plural. Well, Elohim is the plural form of a word that means, that means more than God, more than one God. All right. Now, but look what it says. Now, now, having said that, let me say this. I don't believe we need the Hebrew or the Greek to figure that out because the word of God teaches us that God is plural. Uh, the word God is a, is a plural word. Look what it says in verse number 26. It says this. And God said, let us. Y'all see that? So, so the Bible defines, the Bible teaches. Now look, no doubt about it, the Bible teaches that God is one God. And I'll share some verses in, in just a moment. In fact, I have 28 verses that I've written, written down in my Bible of where the Bible says that there's only one God. But the plurality can be seen in the fact when God says here in verse number 26, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the seas. And so God uses personal pronouns that are plural. In other words, God doesn't say this, I am going to make man in my own image. That's not how God states it. God says, let us make man in our image. So when we study the word God in the Bible, we can see that, yes, although God is one, we can see that the word for God is a plural word. Uh, it's kind of like the word cherub. Have, you know, when you study the Bible, you'll find the word cherub and cherubim. Do you know what cherub means? A cherub is one cherub. Cherubim means more than one cherub. And so when we come to the word God and it states, uh, and, and the word that is used, Elohim, it means it's a plural ending. But that can be seen as you just study the Bible and as you look in verse number 26. Now, uh, I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 6, or excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter number 6. And let me show you the plural, the plural unity of God. Look in Deuteronomy chapter number 6 and verse number 4. When you get there, say amen. All right? Deuteronomy chapter number 6 and then verse number 4. Here's what God says. All right? Now look. It says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord... Okay, capital L, capital O, R, D, all capitals. And when we know when we see capital L all the way through, capital letters all the way through, that's referring to Jehovah God. When we see capital L, O, R, D, that's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's what the Bible says. The Lord, now notice, our God is one Lord. So the word Lord is a singular word there, and the word God is a plural word there. And so the Bible is saying that that 
that God is one God, but He's plural in His existence, in His essence. Isn't that right? Uh, we can see this illustrated. Go to Genesis chapter number 2. We can see this illustrated in the, um, in the marriage union. Look in Genesis chapter number 2. Look at verse number 24. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24. Look what God says here. Are you there? It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and they shall cleave unto his wife. Now notice, here's, here's a singular unit that is plural. And they shall be one flesh. They shall be one flesh. So we can understand this, this, this plural unity. That there are two people that make up one flesh. And so the Word of God teaches us that God is one God, but He's, he's plural in His essence. He's, he's, now look, we're not, we're not tri uh, tritheism. Anybody ever heard of tritheism? Tritheism is the belief that God the Father is a God, God the Holy Spirit is a God, and God, God the Son is a God, and all three of them are their own entity, their own God, and so there's actually three gods. We don't believe that. There is one God, but He's made up in three persons. Now, uh, give, let me show you another verse of Scripture. Go to Genesis chapter number 11. Genesis chapter number 11. Genesis chapter number 11. And look at verse number 5. It says this, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them that they have imagined. And so the Bible tells us in verse number 6 that the people is one. Well, we know that there was a number of people that were there today, but he's talking about that they're one race, one language, one people. Uh, we could kind of see the fact that we know that there's 50 states in the United States of America, although I heard today that California is trying to separate into three different states, and uh, I kind of wish they'd do that with New York City and cut that off from the rest of, of New York State because they hike up the taxes in that state. But anyways, uh, but we know we're all one nation. Uh, also look at um, Hebrew, uh, 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 chapter 11, but look at verse number, um, verse number 7. Notice what God says. He says, go to let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So all of us would agree. And I, I can show you dozens and dozens and dozens of verses that I don't think is necessary tonight because all of us understand that the Bible teaches that there's one God and there is none else. There's only one God. But when you, when you read about God in the Bible, the Bible makes reference to the plurality of God that He uses plural personal pronouns to describe His essence. Now, let me show you another scripture. Go to Genesis chapter 3 and look at verse number 22. Genesis chapter 3 and verses number 22. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 22. Look what it says once again. Here's an example of the plurality of God. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. As one of us. So once again, another example where God referenced to Himself in a plural sense. Now, uh, let me, before I give you some points tonight, I want you to go to, uh, uh, hold your place, we're coming right back to Genesis, but go to Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6. Let me show you another example here. And there's so many, I'm only taking just a small sample of verses, just because literally if we went through all these verses, it would take weeks upon weeks upon weeks, but there's really no need to go through all these verses because they restate the same thing that I'm showing you here. There's just many, many more examples that you can find and do a study on your own. Uh, look what it says in verse number 8 of Isaiah chapter 6. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, now this is what the Lord says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Once again, we find an example in God's word of the plurality of God. There's one God, but in a certain sense, He's plural in His essence. 
Now, go back to Genesis chapter number 1, and, and before I give you some thoughts here tonight, I want you to just uh, read with me. Let me read through this verse. Notice what the Bible says here. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Look at verse number 27. So God created man in his, in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So there are those who believe that God manifests himself in different modes. This is known as modalism or oneness doctrine or the Jesus only uh, doctrine uh, that many people believe. I have one friend that I know of, and I wouldn't even count him a friend, but I know of one person who will only baptize in the name of Jesus because uh, that goes along with the belief of modalism. But they would say in verse number 26, when God says, let us make man in our own image, that God was speaking to the angels. Because what the modalist does is that they try to, to, to take away any distinction between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are the same. Now, I believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one, but I do not believe that God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, or God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are the same. There's a difference between the same and being one. All right? So what they would say is, is that God is speaking to the angels and God is saying, let us make man in our own image. Well, first of all, let me just say this. Did angels, did anywhere in the word of God, does it reference angels to having any part in the creative process? Absolutely none. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was the creator. But also, verse number 27 clears up verse number 26 because the Bible says this, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he them, male and female created he them. So verse number 27 tells us exactly who it was that created uh, male and female. It had nothing to do with the angels. It was the triune God, okay? So the Bible is clear that there is one God, one God, but he's made up of three persons. Now, let me show you in the word of God uh, some distinctions within the Godhead. First of all, the Old Testament scriptures teach us uh, that Jesus is God, the Spirit is God, and the Father is God. Now go to Isaiah chapter number 9, and I'm just going to show a number of verses real quickly here. Isaiah chapter number 9. And look what the Bible says in verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. The Bible says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So here in the Bible, God makes it very clear that Jesus Christ is God. Uh, Isaiah chapter number 7, we're right there. Uh, notice what the Bible says in verse number 14. Uh, God's word states, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We know from the, Old, the New Testament that the word manual literally means, uh, Emmanuel means God with us. Uh, I have many more references and I won't share for sake of time, but we know all throughout the Old Testament, Jesus Christ is called God. Now look, no, no disagreement there. In fact, if you don't believe that Jesus Christ is God, you're not saved. You can't be saved, okay? And so you can have some uh, misunderstanding about the triune God and the Trinity, but if you don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, the Bible is clear that a person can't be saved if you deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. And so uh, Jesus, in other places in the Old Testament, is distinguished from God the Father. Now, this is where I really want to focus in on. Go to Isaiah chapter number 53. Isaiah chapter number 53. Okay? Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit are one God. But are they the same? No, they're not the same. Because the Word of God makes a distinction between the three. Look in Isaiah chapter number 53 and look at verse number 4. Are you there? Say amen. All right, it says this. It says, Surely he hath borne our griefs. Now, who's that referring to? Who was it that bore our griefs? 
It was the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem Him stricken. Now notice, smitten of God and afflicted. So Jesus was smitten by who? By God the Father. Look what it says in verse number 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. So once again, the Bible, even in the Old Testament, makes a distinction between God the Father and God the Son. And the Word of God is very clear. Go to uh, Psalm chapter number 45. Well, you know what? We're right here in Isaiah. So just go to Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter number 61. Now here, in this passage of Scripture, God gives us a distinction between all three members of the Trinity. All right, All three persons of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Notice what the Bible says. Now remember, this verse is quoted in the Gospel according to Luke when Jesus, I think it's in Luke chapter number 3 or Luke chapter number 4, when Jesus came on the scene, Jesus Christ quoted Isaiah chapter 61 and verse number 1, and it says this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So the Bible, in this verse alone, gives us all three distinctions. It shows us the Spirit of the Lord God. It tells us because the Lord, Jehovah God, God the Father, and then it says, hath anointed me, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Isaiah 61, verse 1, all three distinctions of the Godhead are mentioned here in the Old Testament Scripture. Uh, Psalm chapter number 45. Now, you might be thinking, well, Pastor, we have no problem believing this. Look, there is war waging today about this issue right here. Uh, in other churches and in independent circles, um, and, and this is not even a battle that's new to our generation. This has been a battle that has been waging for hundreds and hundreds, hundreds of years, really ever since the start of Christianity and the New Testament Scriptures. This, is, this has been waging about, about how to define, how to express the view of the Godhead. Um, so look at verse number, uh, Psalm chapter number 45, uh, and look at verse number 7, all right? 45, verse number 6. The Bible says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hateth wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Do you know what it's saying? It's saying God has anointed God. That's what that verse is saying. God the Father hath anointed God the Son. And so again, the Bible teaches us here that there are distinctions. Now, you can cross-reference this with Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 8, and I would encourage you to put a reference mark there next to that verse because this is where that verse is used in the New Testament book. In Hebrews chapter number 1, verse number 8, in fact, go over there. I want you to see this verse because the Bible defines to us who God is. When the Word of God says in verse number 7, therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows, the New Testament Scriptures clears up the matter and shows us without a doubt who God is who's anointing God. Alright? Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 7. Or 8. Are you there? Hebrews 1, 8 says, but unto the Son He saith. Now remember, the Son was referenced to in Psalm 45, verse number 6 and 7. How was He referenced in the Old Testament? He was referenced as God. So in Hebrews chapter 1, and verse number 8, But unto the Son He saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Thy kingdom. So once again, the Word of God makes distinctions between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let me show you another one very quickly. Go to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Psalm 110. Now look at verse number um, 1. Are you there? It says this, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, 
That is a reference to God the Father, Jehovah God. No doubt about that. But we also know that the Lord Jesus Christ is co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal with God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is as much God as God the Father. And the Bible makes a distinction where it says, the Lord said unto my Lord. So, so please understand that within the Godhead, th there cannot be a view such as modalism that says that there's only one God, but he sometimes expresses himself in different modes. Sometimes he's God the Father, sometimes he's Jesus, sometimes he's the Holy Spirit, but he's never all three at the same time. <coughs> there, Look, the verses that I give you is just a tiny, tiny fraction of the hundreds of verses throughout the Word of God that says statements just like the ones that we're reading through throughout the Old Testament, that there is a distinction between God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the Son. Now, now in the New Testament, now turn over to the book of John, but in the New Testament, the Bible also teaches that there is one God, but that God is plural in His unity, and that there are distinctions within the Godhead. Uh, go to John chapter number 6. Now, I remember when I bought my van, it meant, some of you might uh, remember when I first moved here, I had a Ford Windstar. Is it called a Windstar? What was it called? Um, no, it wasn't a Windstar. There was another name for it. Yeah. <laughs> Ford, uh, well, anyways, when we bought that van, after I bought the van from the sales guy back at my home, uh, home area, you know, we got talking about the Lord and stuff, and uh, very, very, very quickly in our conversation, I figured out that this man was probably a Jehovah Witness, but he denied the deity of Jesus Christ. He did not believe that Jesus Christ was God. He, and, and I could not believe what I was hearing when he said this. He said, show me one verse in the Bible where Jesus claimed to be God. He said, show me one verse in the Bible where the Word of God states that Jesus Christ is God. He said Jesus Christ made no claims that he is God. So we took out our Bibles and we went through a number of verses to disprove what he was trying to say or to show him that he was in error. But look what it says in John chapter number 20, uh, John chapter number 6 and verse number uh, 27. Here's what God says, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you for him hath God the Father sealed. So two things in this verse. Number one, in this verse, we see the distinction is made between God the Father and God the Son. They are not the same. It is one God, but they are not, but they are not the same person. But what I want, also want you to see is that the Bible references God, the Father of being God. The Bible uses the expression God the Father. So when we say God the Father, that's a biblical term. Now, there are some who would say the Bible may say God the Father, but nowhere in the Word of God does it say God the Son. Nowhere does it say God the Son. Well, look with me in Hebrews, if you would. Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 8. Now, we all know those verses where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made. And so we know that no doubt about it, the New Testament teaches that Jesus Christ is God. But look what the Bible says here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 8, because once again, the Word of God specifically states that Jesus Christ is God's Son, and He is God. Look what it says. But unto the Son He saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So, number one, the Bible states the Father is God. It uses the expression... God the Father. Number two, the Word of God states that the Son is God. So it would be correct for us to say God the Son. And then let me show you, uh, and, and by the way, there's many more verses to prove that Jesus Christ is God. And I know that you know many of those verses. I won't take the time tonight uh, because I have so many things I want to look at and our time's almost gone. But look at Acts chapter number five. Go to Acts chapter number five. Acts chapter number 5. All right, Acts 5, look at verse number 3. All right, once again, here's what God's Word says here. 
Uh, the Bible says, And Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto who? God. Now verse number 3 tells us who did he lie to? Lied to the Holy Spirit. And then the Bible referenced the Holy Spirit in verse number 4 as being God. So the Bible makes very clear statements throughout the pages of its Word that God the Father is God, God the Son is God, God the Holy Spirit is God. Now, no argument there. All right? Not even from the modalists. They would say that the Holy Spirit is God. They would say that Jesus is God. And they would say that the Father is God because they believe that they're one and the same. But here's what I want to show you tonight. I want to give you about... I've got probably at least 20 verses here. But I want to give you about six or seven verses from the New Testament that make distinctions between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All right? First one is the most obvious one. Uh, well, one of the most obvious ones, Matthew chapter number 3. So turn over to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter number 3. All right, Matthew chapter 3, look at verse number 16 and verse 17. Matthew chapter number 3. Now, Matthew chapter 3 is recording the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse number 13, the Word of God says, Then Jesus cometh from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Verse number 16, the Word of God says, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. So already in this passage, we have the Holy Spirit, we have Jesus Christ, and the Bible says in verse number 17, And lo, a voice from heaven uh, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So right here in Matthew chapter number 3, there's no doubt about it unless someone is trying to purposely distort what God's Word says. If we're going to be honest and true to God's Word, God makes a distinction between the Holy Spirit, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Father. Alright? No doubt about it. Uh, turn over to John chapter 14. John chapter number 14. John 14. Look at verse number 16. Now, John 14, 15, 16, and 17, these, this, this distinction can be found all throughout these four chapters. So you just read through these chapters and you'll see the distinctions, but I just want to show you a couple. Look in John chapter 14 in verse number 16. God's Word says, And I will pray the Father. Now, who's, who's Jesus praying? Who's speaking? Who's I? The second word of that verse. Who's I? It's Jesus. Jesus says, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. So right in verse number 16, we find three distinctions. Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the Comforter. And, and, and to, to go along with the fact, to kind of rewind a little bit, and you remember when I was talking about the Holy Spirit being God, the Holy Spirit is, when the Bible says, I'll give you another comforter, the word another means another of the same kind. In other words, Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit is just like me. He's co-equal, He's co-eternal, He's co-existent with God the Father and God the Son. Uh, look at um, uh, verse number 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So, you know, I mean, talk to me a little bit. Is there any confusion there about any of the distinctions that are made between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? It's easy, isn't it, Kezron? I mean, like I said, this is... My children understand this. This is not hard. It's not hard to see this, all right? Uh, let me show you another verse of Scripture. Luke chapter number 1. Luke chapter number 1. Now, you, you might be thinking, well, this is not a big deal to me. I've got this handled. Look, there are churches that are splitting over this issue. There are, there are churches on, 
on YouTube that are fighting with others, there's all kinds of discord and disagreement over this issue all over the country because this idea, this modalism belief system has crept into uh, some minds of, of, of so-called independent Baptist preachers. And, and to me, the Word of God is very, very, very clear that there's one God who's made up of three persons, made up of, of, of three uh, uh, persons that are distinct one from another. I don't see why that's hard to understand. Uh, look what it says in Luke chapter number 1, verse number 35. It says this, And the angel said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. All right, there's the Holy Ghost. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. There's God the Father. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. There is Jesus Christ. Uh, go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. This is the greatest verse to show the truth of the Trinity. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7. I remember, I don't know, probably six months ago, I, I just mentioned to Brother Mike, maybe we saw it in uh, Faith Bible Institute, whatever the case was, and uh, I said, you know, the, the, there's the modalists say that God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and uh, God the Son are not three distinct persons, but He's one God that, that uh, you know, will be in different modes, and He's never all of the three at one time. And Brother Mike said, 1 John 5, 7. And so, that's right. Look what it says. For there are how many? Three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. One God who's made up of three persons. Now, there are a lot of people who don't like the word persons. You, you, you put whatever word you want to put in there. I, I don't know how else to describe it other than saying persons or three essence, I, whatever. As long as you believe that there's one God that's made up of three persons who are co-equal, co-existent, and co-eternal with one another. Let me show you one last verse of Scripture. A uh, couple more verses of Scripture. Go to Revelation chapter 4. I have so many, and I'd like to show all of them to you, but I, I think we all get the point. It's, it's uh, I mean, it, it's, we're just restating the same truth over and over and over. It can be found from Genesis to Revelation hundreds and hundreds of places. But look in Revelation chapter 4, verse number 2. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. One sat on the throne. All right? Now, who is sitting on the throne? All right? Who's ruling on the throne? Well, we know it's God the Father, and, you know, when I was a younger child, I just took for granted that it was Jesus Christ. But it can't be Jesus Christ because look in chapter number 5 and verse number, uh, verse number 5, it says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, and sent, uh, sent forth into all the earth. And notice what it says in verse number 7, And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. Now look, if modalism is true, how do you explain any of these verses? If Jesus Christ is not three persons, or excuse me, if the Godhead is not three persons at the same time, how do you explain all these verses? And so, again, the, it cannot be true that God is one God who manifests... Him. Sometimes He's Jesus, sometimes He's the Holy Spirit, and sometimes He's God the Father, but He's never all three at the same time. No, no. And if you want to get stuck on labels as far as you know the word Trinity or not, whatever. Use the word Godhead as long as you believe. Use the word triunity as long as you believe that there's one God made up of three persons who are co-equal, co-eternal with, with one another. Now, let me show you one last verse, and then I'll say something about the purpose of the Godhead um, very quickly, and our time is gone. Acts chapter number uh, 2. Go to Acts chapter number 2. Acts chapter number 2.
Verse 33, the Word of God states, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, He hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. And so, verse number 32 mentions Jesus Christ. Verse number 33 mentions Jesus Christ. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And so these verses literally are just a small fraction, just a small sample of the dozens of dozens of verses that makes distinctions between the, the Godhead or the Trinity. Now, the Bible states that uh, man is made in the spirit, man is made in spirit, soul, and body. And so when the Word of God states that we are made in the image of God, we know that God has a body. His name is Jesus Christ. We know God has a soul. That's the Holy Spirit. We know God the Father is a spirit. No man has seen God at any time. And so we're made in God's image. And so here's, here's the thing that some people get confused upon. Some people think, look, here's what I noticed, and I didn't mark it out, but I'm sure that if you go and, and, and do the study for yourself, you're going to find this to be true. But what I have found is when you, when you read these different verses that make distinction between uh, the, in the, God, the, the distinctions within the Godhead, you're going to find that sometimes uh, God the Father is mentioned first, sometimes the Holy Ghost is mentioned first, sometimes God the Son is mentioned first. I mean, all throughout the Bible it's stated that way, way. Why? Well, because there's equality. And so some people think that God the Father is the main God, and God the Son is kind of like the little God, and then God the Holy Spirit is like the lesser of the three, of, of, of three gods. No, that's not true. They... They are equal in every aspect, but the, the, where, where the thing comes in is that they are, in, within the Godhead, there's an order of submission, but not, not with anything that has to do with being inferior, just like we know that um, within a marriage. Uh, my wife and, and me, and you and your wife and, and your spouses, look, no, nobody is of more value. I mean, you're, you're both the soul in the eyes of God. You're both equal in the eyes of God, but you have different roles. And so you submit to those roles. And so the Father uh, has His function. The Holy Spirit of God submits to the function uh, in His role. The Holy Spirit of God uh, lifts up and glorifies the name of Jesus Christ. And so there's, there's, there's a submission, there's an order within the Godhead, but that doesn't make them any less God. That doesn't make them any less equal. That doesn't make them any less inferior. It's one God made up of three persons. And uh, it's as simple as that. And so someone may say, well, I just can't wrap the idea in my mind of the fact one God, but there's three. Well, there's not three gods. One God made up of three persons. That's how the Bible. That's how the Bible states it. Now, look. If you can't understand that, that that's fine. But you don't have to understand it to believe it. You know, there's a lot of things that I don't understand, but I believe. I don't understand the fact that why God would love me. I mean, I know enough about myself to know that I'm not lovable, and yet God loves me. And so I, I can't understand it, but I just praise God and thank Him for it. And so we have an all-wise, almighty, infinite, glorious, great God. He's one God, but He's plural in His essence. And I'm thankful for that. He's a tr I remember at college, my pastor where I went to college, he, would, he used this term, and I've read it in many places since then. I know he didn't think of the term, but I remember he said that God is a triunity. And that's exactly what He is. He's a triunity. And the Word of God three times in, in the New Testament uses the word the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. These three are one. One God, but they're distinct in their functions. They're distinct uh, in their persons, but they're co-equal. They're co-eternal. They're co-existent from eternity past, eternity future. Thank God for that. It's not, it's not hard, is it? It's easy. And uh, praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you once again. For